Greetings, fellow Bereans and truth seekers, wherever you are. This is a message for you, particularly those of you involved in corporate churches, that is, institutional churches. Now, you must know that 99.9% .9 of the churches in America are corporations of the state. They've signed up for the 501c3 corporate designation. Now, I want to explain what that means. Now, if you don't think your church is a 501c3, you're probably mistaken, because most of them in America are. If they hand out tithing envelopes, if you're able to deduct your tithes and offerings from your income tax, then it's a corporate church, because the 501c3 church is the only kind of church that's allowed to do that, and they all do it. But it's not a for sure sign. You can do a corporation search and you can find every corporation in America. Usually it's done state by state. But to do that you have to have the correct legal name of the church and sometimes churches are registered outside of their immediate area and they're hard to track down. If that all fails, ask your pastor point blank. It would be very hard for him to lie about that. Ask him, is this a 501c3 church? He will most likely say yes. You will also find a business license somewhere on the wall. All of those are earmarks of the corporate church. And if you're in a corporate church, you need to listen to this very carefully. The corporate church has taken itself out from under the authority of Christ. Now, I'm going to read from one of my books where I quote Greg Dixon Sr., who came out of the corporate church system. He had one of the biggest independent fundamental churches in America. He was a household name. His church was big. And he came out, and he paid a high price. It's an interesting story, because he came from very humble beginnings. He didn't even have a name, really, until he was 11 or 12 years old and he was bounced from household to household. And he went from that humble beginning to pastoring one of the biggest churches in America at the time. And the Lord called him out, he and his church. They woke up, they realized the 501c3 corporation put them under the authority of Caesar. And the Lord prevailed on his heart and the hearts of his congregation that they came out of her but the price was high. They lost everything. And Greg Dixon Sr. was willing to put everything on the line, and he did. And thanks to him, I got an education about the 501c3 corporate church and what the government does when you try and get out of it, especially if you have huge assets. And they did. Those assets were seized, and they were sold for pennies on the dollar. And Greg Dixon Sr., was put out on the street, basically, because he did not want to be part of that corruption. Now let me read the point that Greg Dixon Sr. gave in one of his sermons. He went through the Corporate Church Act based on letters that the IRS had sent him. Number one, a church must have a distinct legal existence. That is incorporation. Number two, a church must have a recognized that is, IRS-approved creed and form of worship. It cannot include partisan politics. Number three, it must have a definite and distinct ecclesiastical government. The IRS only recognizes a hierarchical church government, that is, Catholic church form of government. The IRS will not recognize a church under a pastor who is under Christ. Number four, it must have a formal code of doctrine and discipline approved by the IRS. Number five, it must have a distinct religious history, must be denominational. It cannot be autonomous. It cannot be a Bible-believing church. Number six, it is an organization of ordained ministers. The church is no longer an organism in the biblical sense. Rather, it is an organization. Number seven, it must have educated ministers 
which only includes those educated at state accredited college. Thus, Jesus and his disciples would not qualify. A church must be a tax-exempt organization. This means the church exists because the IRS allows it to. Number 9. Churches must submit to the IRS by paying a user fee or tribute. The church agrees that it owes its existence to the state. Number 10. It must be engaged in activities that further exclusively public purposes rather than private interests. In brackets, a true Church of Christ exists for the personal and private interest of her head, Jesus Christ. Number 11. It must answer to the IRS as to its daily activities. Number 12. The IRS will control all finances and their sources and who their donors are and how the money is spent. Number 13. If a church uses cash, it may be suspected of money laundering and prosecuted. Number 14. All books and records must be made available to the IRS at all times. Number 15. It must answer to the IRS in the matter of serving as an informer as to who serves at the church. Number 16. It must inform the IRS as to almsgiving. In brackets, this violates Jesus' commandment regarding giving alms. Matthew chapter 6, verses 1 through 4. Number 17. The IRS state church must inform the IRS of love gifts over $600 and file 1099 documents. Number 18. The IRS state church must use only IRS-approved methods of fundraising. Number 19. The IRS state church pastor will answer to the IRS for any position he takes against the tax system of this country. Number 20. The pastor must answer to the IRS and give unlimited submission to the civil magistrate pertaining to all laws, federal and state, including public policy. Number 21. The pastor must promote and advocate race mixing. Number 22. The pastor cannot enter the public fray against licensors of church ministries. Number 23. The pastor cannot engage in political activities regarding opposition of pornography. Number 24. The pastor cannot actively oppose legislation that says children belong to the state, not their parents. Number 25. The pastor cannot oppose legislation that supports state lottery or gambling. Number 26. The pastor cannot advocate support of the United States or state constitutions as the supreme law of the United States. In brackets, public policy takes precedence over the Constitution. Number 27. The pastor cannot participate in the formation of a political action committee. Number 28. The pastor cannot actively participate in opposing the public school system. And finally, number 29. The pastor cannot declare publicly that the church is to obey God and not government. Now those are 29 points that Greg Dixon Sr. touched on in a sermon that he gave some time back. I wrote a book about this. Let me show you. It's called Come Out of Her, My People. This is the Greg Dixon story. This lays out his early childhood, how he rose to prominence in the religious world, and how the IRS took him out. It's a fascinating book. I would consider it an important historical document and record of what happens when a pastor of a large church with significant power and public acclaim comes out of the system. You do not get to leave Mystery Babylon without a fight. And it cost him dearly. And it was a fight. It was a battle. And when in the thick of the battle he most needed help, all the pastors of the big churches that previously stood by him fled like rats from a sinking ship. 
He stood alone. Not a one of them was with him. Yet they all believed that he was right. When push came to shove, they were not about to jeopardize their assets and their incomes. And they backed off, and he stood alone. Greg Dixon Sr. and God. Serious business. This book, Come Out of Her, My People. You can get it at www.thebookpatch.com or, if you like, I will send you a PDF of it. Because if you're in one of those institutional churches, you need this information. You're in the belly of the beast. You're under the authority of Caesar, not Jesus. It doesn't matter what your pastor says or what kind of rhetoric you're hearing in your church. If it's a 501c3 corporation, it is a corporation of the state, and the rules must be obeyed to receive all the benefits of the 501c3 charitable corporation. If you violate the agreement, the IRS has the right to seize your property and kick your pastor out and kick all of you out of your church. They have that right. Usually a slap on the wrist is sufficient. Most pastors back off when they get a slap on the wrist. They're not about to jeopardize their revenues, their income, their status. Greg Dixon Sr. was not such a man. He was a man who stood on his principles. This book, I wrote this book in cooperation with Greg Dixon Sr. Now he passed away and he wanted this book published. And so I wrote this book as though it's Greg Dixon Sr. speaking, but it's entirely my work putting this all together, assembling this book. Then I would send the documents to Greg Dixon Sr. and he would approve them or recommend changes. And that's how the process came about. So this is a book that has the full approval of the late, great Greg Dixon Sr. If you don't have it, go to thebookpatch.com or send me an email requesting a PDF. God bless you all. Thank you for listening.